It was 1996 when the Chief Executive of Australia's Commission for the Future, Dr Peter Elliott, made his forecast that 70% of the job categories and services for the year 2020 were yet to be invented, and that most people would have between four and ten different jobs during their working lives. This 2013 documentary film looks at the year 2020. In particular, it's interested in the type of future workplaces our secondary school graduates will enter. Will these graduates feel that their schools have prepared them well for the 2020 workplace? Or will they conclude that they've been educated with the last century in mind? In this documentary, we visit seven of South Australia's most innovative businesses. We learn about how they currently organise their work and how technology in the global marketplace are key drivers for innovation. Importantly, each of these industry leaders provides us with an insight into what the 2020 workplace might be like. Simulation in the last 10 to 12 years has changed a lot because of the impact of the games industry in particular. A rail sim circa 1990s was normally built with um, video as the vision, um, filmed from an actual train and then replayed on the simulator. Now it's all computer generated imagery. We're continually changing our technology and we encourage innovation um, throughout the company uh, at all levels um, to actually improve the product. The simulation industry in general is going to a, a highly immersive uh, area where the operator of the simulator actually feels like they're in the environment. So the technologies that facilitate that surround vision, audio, the computer graphics, real-time computer graphics, stereo computer graphics, uh, motion simulation, all of those sort of uh, technologies uh, starting to make a big impact into the simulation industry. Um, this is a training facility at the University of South Australia and we use it for um, simulation of clinical environments for medical imaging students. We've got so much more technology than even 10-15 um, years ago and that technology is evolving as well. So we've gone from film screen technology to um, CR, which is computed radiography, now to direct radiography where it's um, a recording plate that records the image. So it's like a computer plate that records the image and then you take the information directly from that and you can digitally manipulate that image. The added bonus is that we can um, go inside the patient and change the perspective of the room. Um, turn the laser lights on, that's what we use for positioning the patient to find what's called an isocenter within the patient. So, you know, there might be a, a lung tumour and a target volume that we're trying to deliver a dose of radiation to. Yeah, that's the, um, the target volume of the, the tumour. And so you can see um, that it's in um, the right lung, but we can also see the other structures in there. I talked about the three planes and using the lasers to set the isocenter, which is a point within the target volume. We've just turned on the axes there of X, Y and Z, and so they're the coordinates that the students are learning um, to put into practice to identify where their isocenter is within the target volume. Topcom Precision Agriculture uh, develops products which uh, use GPS technology and machine control uh, to control and reduce inputs in farming. So our latest technology developments uh, include the wireless communication with the consoles in the tractor. This enables uh, farmers and farm management organisations to effectively control, steer, adjust the inputs in farming from remote locations. They effectively don't have to be in the tractor to drive the tractor. They can have an operator in the tractor, but also at the same time control where the tractor goes, what the inputs are, and how the, the 
how it uh, operates. They can go into the tractor from a remote location through the internet, see what the settings are, change the boundaries that the tractor operates in. So it's very, very exciting technology and, and uh, you know, we're very proud that this company in Adelaide has been able to lead the development of that technology. We, we support and manage the maintenance of that console from three offices in the world, 24 hours a day. We do eight hours in Adelaide, eight hours in Madrid in Spain, and eight hours in Silicon Valley in California. They, they speak uh, a total of 17 languages and they can manage the support for those customers worldwide from those three offices which split up the 24 hour shifts. So innovation is a core driver of our business and a core indicator of our future success. So our investment in R&D is critical for our business sustainability. We invest almost 15% of our revenue, sales revenues, back into R&D. So obviously the people in that department are the engine room of our business and the driver of future success. But we are doing a lot of research and development, blue sky work and where we think technology might be moving. For this company, electric vehicles is certainly something that uh, is on our horizon in terms of the technology development that we need to be working on. And the sorts of skills that we need are obviously our engineering capabilities, our hardware designers, our software programmers, but also on the production uh, floor we need people that are involved in quality projects, Kaizen activities, continuous improvement activities because our products now are benchmarked on a global platform. And that means we have to be cost competitive, we have to have the high quality, and we have to have products with features that consumers want to buy. We're a fairly small organisation, we're only 12 people, but we're sort of embedded within a, what is the largest industry in the world. That industry, unlike most, requires just about every discipline working together in an integrated fashion to succeed. So on the um, science side, we're, we're working very, very closely with engineers, uh, whether they be petroleum engineers, facilities engineers, uh, mechanical engineers, electrical. Um, and then uh, the geotechnical professions are very, very important. So the geology, geophysics, petrophysics, things like that. So people understanding the subsurface and then people understanding how to deal with a product once, once you mine it. And beyond that, then there's a series of, uh, of commercial, um, legal, financial uh, environment, increasingly important. Um, all these professionals have to work together uh, at the formative stage of a project right, right through to completion. But we, we, we systematically manage data flow from all sources that we need to form a uh, a picture, firstly an accurate picture of what is the state of the, the market or the industry we're looking at at the moment uh, and then secondly what are the signs of early change. So the information and synthesis of that is uh, incredibly uh, important and then the second thing is to actually look at analogues from around the world of where certain change events ha have caused a change in a market or, or, or an outcome for a company. So we're perpetually scanning the world for evidence of, of how change might evolve in our own markets. Uh, the combination of those two things and, um, you know, laterally thinking individuals um, is the art form, really. Players at training and in games have GPS units and then uh, we have analysts who analyse that data and, and try and set pro training programs um, you know, to replicate what they're doing in a game. Uh, the other one is uh, mainly video analysis and, and video software. So, you know, having a look at what the players do in the games and, and used as a teaching tool, to, there's a lot of analysis of, of what the players are doing. So, you know, there's a lot of the, uh, the GPS guys who are watching what they, they do in a game, how far they run, how many uh, sprints of in excess of X amount of kilometres an hour they do and then trying to set up a training program that trains for that and replicates that. We uh, focus on, on a broad area of design. It's, it's not only architecture but it's urban design, mm -hmm. furniture design. You know, it's the digital technologies that allow us to participate 
you know, in an area or a market or a sector that was previously not available to us. You know. But yeah, the flat structure, it's a way, you know, we understood that was a way of the workforce, it was a way to engage, you know, certainly at that time the Gen X's and, and even more so or the Gen Y's. I think it's, you know, children, kids coming through school have, you know, they work in teams, they work in very different ways to how my education and probably even your education would have been. Twenty twenty is not too far away. So the nature of work and the effects of technology are likely to be simple extensions of things that are already happening. So what are some of the work functions, work patterns and workflows that we can expect our students to encounter in the 2020 workplace? There's a move to to create uh, an external workforce. So already what we're seeing is that companies are organizing virtual workforces on a project by project basis. So the concept what we used to think of as outsourcing, which was uh, essentially a call center in India or, or in Asia somewhere, that model has shifted to the, to the place where a virtual workforce exists all over the planet. And the benefit of that is that people can live anywhere and work everywhere. People aren't in the one profession forever. Uh, they don't hold the same qualifications forever. There is that in and out of what we do. I've come that way too. I didn't start architecture till I was about, you know, I finished architecture when I was about 42. And digital technology has is, is just opened the floodgates. It enables us to uh, undertake projects in, in, on the eastern seaboard, regionally in South Australia. Uh, we haven't done anything in Western Australia yet. We've done some work in Darwin, uh, a little bit in New York, and um, you know, a little bit in France. From a pure engineering point of view, we still build hardware, uh, construct cabs that the simulators uh, uh, use. We have a lot of electronics to make things go. Obviously, there's computer software programming. There's the computer graphics uh, industry. There's also uh, for mechanical engineers and people like that, the ability to model dynamic systems so that we can actually produce a simulation of something real. Yeah, I think, uh, well, two areas. One, we've talked about, you know, the growing amount of data so we can collect it easily now. But the ability for systems to mine that data and actually start to predict things like injury potential, that's certainly a big one that, you know, a lot of sports science departments are aiming for is to come up with this model or a system that actually predict that a player may get injured if you keep carrying on, so maybe you need to adjust his workload. So I think being able to actually predict things and model is, is one area based on being able to collect all this data. You hear a lot about simulators perhaps in airlines and pilots learning to fly and in the army. They do a lot of those simulations and they cost millions of dollars, which are obviously out of our reach, but I think gradually that will start making an impact as well. Um, so players' ability to learn, if you like, hopefully we'll get, we'll be fast-tracked. We asked leaders in each of our innovative workplaces about the attributes and skills young adults would need to transition successfully into the 2020 workplace. One of the key capabilities for 2020 is learning how to change. Others include learning how to apply theory in real-world contexts, and being able to work in a team. Some industries like Red Arc are explicit about specific subjects, such as mathematics and science. The key attitudes for the TopCon workforce are anywhere, anytime, and having a global perspective. At Studio 9, it's learning for life, multitasking, and using technologies that are the three fundamental capabilities. And at Core Energy Group, the essential skills were using and understanding data, building and sustaining networks, and working interdependently. This graph is taken from Richard Florida's 2003 book, The Rise of the Creative Class. 
The graph shows the relative percentages of the types of work in the labour market and how they've changed dramatically over the course of the 20th century. Florida's book tells a compelling story. It's the story of how the new middle class for the 21st century is, in fact, the creative class. Well, there's a fundamental question that we have to ask in school. And that question is, what does it mean to be educated? And, and what, what is it that kids need to be successful in life beyond school? That's really a question that we haven't asked. You know, what we're doing is we're taking a model that's 100 years old and we're, we're just tinkering with it. You know, if we just, if we just t tweak it a little bit, if we, if we use some more paint and, and, a, and, a, and a nicer ribbon, you know, everything will be okay. Oh, if we just use some technology, everything will be okay. But the thing is, it won't be okay. The, the challenge for education is the same challenge that faces corporations in the face of disruptive innovation. And let me explain. If you're Kodak, you know, 100 years ago, you were the player. It, it's, how, it's how photography was done. 100 years later, all of a sudden, Kodak is gone. Blockbuster is gone. So many of the big names that were present are gone. Why did they go? They, they went because they were faced with massive change in their industry. And they were, uh, when I'm working with corporations, I say there's, there's three reasons why corporations fail or businesses fail in the face of disruptive innovation. Either they are unaware of, unable to, or unwilling to respond to change. So either they don't see the changes happening, or they see it and don't believe that it's valid, that there'll be a shift back towards their technology. Or they just have such a, such a dogma in their corporation that they can't make the shift. And this is the challenge facing schools, because schools were conceived to essentially be an information delivery system, and a darn good one. You know, really, it was an organized structure for communicating knowledge to the masses. So 100 years later, if you're faced with a different time, a time when all of a sudden perhaps there are other means of accessing information. So if you're in the information delivery business and a better system comes along, like perhaps the Internet, then all of a sudden, your business doesn't need to exist anymore. Today's futurists predict that the workplace in 2020 will be less routine and that it will have increased hyper-connectedness. They forecast that the workplace will operate new patterns of work, such as swarming and 24-7, 365, where the lines between personal, professional, social and family matters will all but disappear. There'll be more active engagement with experimentation and with simulated virtual environments within the workplace. And we can expect that the boundaries between businesses and enterprises will begin to erode. So if this is going to be the evolving nature of 21st century work, the key question for those of us in schools is, are we preparing students for their future or for our past? Firstly, we need to understand that learning doesn't have to take place at a specific time. It doesn't take, take, take place in 30 minutes and in 30-minute blocks broken down by subjects. Uh, so not in a specific time, not in a specific place. Learning doesn't have to happen in a school. Learning can happen in the community. Learning can happen in real life. Learning can happen anywhere, and it can happen any time. The whole model has to shift to a model where we're focusing on the planet, where we're focusing on community. For me, I would love to see school organized around altruistic service, around focusing on helping others, on, on bringing the curriculum and bringing the content to that, on honoring the curiosity and the passion that the individual has and allowing them to explore that, allowing them to be the best at whatever it is that they wish to do, tied into the real world so that we don't have a school and a real world, but what we have is an ongoing training ground that is life. This is really how school needs to shift. In, in this time, when, when the economy changes so quickly, when the job market changes so quickly, when life changes so quickly, nobody really needs, or very few people need, that four-year or that six-year degree anymore. Certainly, there are specialties that do. Certainly, your doctors, your people like this that are going to be focusing on those areas need that kind, of, that kind of rigor and that kind of content. But for the most part, what we need is not a four-year degree, but 40 years of constant learning, unlearning, and relearning. And, and so school becomes just a way that we live. And it becomes a progression and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a movement that starts with the individual and, and moves to the community.